Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club. Thank you all so much for being here today at the only scheduled public debate in any of the statewide races. That's at least as far as we know today, September 15th. What a special audience we have all turned out to be. We are here for the debate in the race for the Auditor of the State of Ohio. In alphabetical order and standing my right to my left or your left to your right, are our candidates Bob Bridges of the Libertarian Party, State Representative John Carney of the Democratic Party, and incumbent Auditor Dave Yost, a Republican. We're also very glad that Ideastream's Nick Castell is here to moderate, and in a moment I'll hand this over to Nick. But first, though, I would like to thank all the candidates and their campaigns for joining us today. We know that public scrutiny can make a campaign difficult and an elected office challenging. But as those of you seeking to be our next auditor can attest, scrutiny is exactly what makes democracy strong and vital. And it's public exchanges like this that go back more than 100 years here at the City Club, hundreds of years in our nation's history, and thousands of years in the history of democracy. It is public exchanges like this that make democracy vital and strong. Thank you. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Nick Castell. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I'm Nick Castell. I'm a reporter and producer at Ideastream, WCPN Public Radio. And thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, before we start, I want to review some of the rules. Uh, we'll begin here with opening statements, and each candidate will have a total of three minutes for these statements. They may divide this time between an opening statement and a rebuttal to their challenger's opening statements. Um, the order was uh, chosen by drawing earlier. Now, our times here today will be strictly enforced, so excessive cheering, applause, heckling will be deducted by the timekeeper from the candidate's closing response, so please keep that in mind during the course of this debate. Um, according to our drawing, Mr. Yost will go first, Mr. Carney will go second, and Mr. Bridges will go last. Uh, so we'll begin, gentlemen, with the opening statements. You have um, three minutes. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here today. Uh, my name is Dave Yost, and I'm currently the Auditor of State. I'm running for re-election. I am the oldest of six kids, and I grew up uh, here in Ohio. Went to school here, worked my way through Ohio State University and Capital Law. Uh, my kids still live here, and my grandkids live in Ohio. I, I'm invested in this state. I started off life as a newspaper reporter uh, for the old Citizen Journal, and a grizzled old veteran when I was a young kid told me, Dave, your job here is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Well, I don't know about afflicting anybody, but I found that there's a direction in Sam Perdue's words to me, that we hold the powerful accountable and we stand for the powerless. I've done that my whole life as a newspaper reporter. Later, when I became county auditor, which is the CFO for a county organization, 1,000 employees, $40 million general budget as an attorney in private practice, and later yet as prosecuting attorney for Delaware County. You know, there's probably nobody that feels as powerless as the survivor of a crime. And I've sat with those survivors and sometimes cried with them and stood up for them in court. And the powerful, we held them accountable too. Politicians, two sheriffs, a party boss uh, in another county, clerk of courts in another county. Folks that did wrong paid the price and were convicted for their crimes. I stood up for the powerless, the little kids in our school districts who have been victimized by adults who cheated, who lied about the numbers, or rogue charter school operators that were stealing money away from their opportunities. I don't take sides, not with management or labor, not with Republicans or Democrats. I'm on your side. I've been endorsed by the Ohio Society of CPAs, I think in part because of my record as for independence. And I'd like to stay on the job another four years. I'm here to talk about my record and to ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Carney? Uh, first of all, I want to thank the City Club of Cleveland. What an honor it is for me to be here today, for all of us, really. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt spoke to this group. 
Rosa Parks spoke to this group. Uh, as public servants, we are paid by you, the taxpayers, and it is our obligation and responsibility to appear before you and take your questions and talk about what we plan to do with our office. Uh, it's also an incredible honor for me to be here because I grew up here in Cleveland. On the west side, part of an Irish Catholic family of a dozen children. Uh, I've learned a lot of lessons being in a family of a dozen kids. When I was in second grade, I got my first job on my brother's paper route carrying the plain dealer. I got paid a dollar a day, as I recall, and through working on paper routes and cutting lawns and babysitting and uh, working at fast food restaurants, I managed to save over $10,000 and paid my own way through Ohio State University, undergrad and law school. Graduated from law school and went on to become a healthcare attorney for the last 13 years. I've been putting doctor's practices together all across the country as an attorney at Porter Wright. And really felt like I had been so lucky uh, to have a great public education in Bay Village and have parents who instilled in me hard work ethic that I owed a lot back and thought evidence-based ideas would create bipartisanship in the legislature. So I went out and knocked on 13,484 doors personally, and I got elected to a district that hadn't had a Democrat in 25 years and joined the legislature. During my time in office, over 92% of the bills that I sponsored and co-sponsored, in fact, did have bipartisan support. And I went back out in 2010, and every Democrat in my district lost except for me. Uh, and it was because of the fact that I managed to reach across the party lines and work in a bipartisan way and get things done for the people. Now, unfortunately, in, in 2010, a bunch of folks got elected to statewide office and joined the apportionment board to include my opponent, Mr. Yost. And he, on the apportionment board, drew the most partisan districts in the country. In fact, now, in your legislature, for many of your elected officials, the more partisan they are, the more likely they are to be reelected. And the more bipartisan they are, the more likely they are to lose elections. You wonder why your government doesn't work? I'll tell you it doesn't work because we drew districts to incent people to run away from each other in a democracy that's built upon compromise and working together and getting things done for you. And what's happened because of that? Well, in your legislature just this past term, the folks in power gave $600 more per student and the worst charter schools in the state, and the best ones took a cut. And you wonder why? Well, guess what? The folks who run the worst charter schools in the state happen to be the biggest contributors to Republicans in the legislature who made those choices. Unfortunately, I'll have to wait for a little more time. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Kearney. <laughs> Mr. Bridges. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to the City Club of Cleveland for hosting this debate. Thank you for including the Libertarians in the debate today. I feel it's vitally important to Ohio that they hear all voices of all political parties so that we can have a free exchange of ideas and that you, the voting public, can make an honest choice. If many of you haven't heard of me, I'm not surprised. I am the third party candidate. My name is Bob Bridges. I'm married. I'm a small business owner. I live down in Columbus, Ohio. I have two wonderful children. One, uh, my, my daughter, she's getting ready to start, well, she is started her first year of college, and my son started his first year of high school. So if anybody of you are parents in here, you know my uh, challenges and my uh, pride that I feel for my children. I want to point out one thing to everybody here today. The three of us standing up here have more than one thing in common besides running for auditor of state. We're Ohioans. We love our state very much. We're passionate about our state very much. Why else would we be doing this? I'm running for auditor to be the watchdog of your money, the people's money. For far, far too long, we have let the fox guard the hen house down in Columbus. And it's time we need somebody there to look out for us. And I'm not a long-winded long speaker, so. <laughs> to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Yost, you have uh, 30 seconds to, uh, to respond. Well, it might surprise you, but you'll probably hear a few times uh, today when uh, Representative Carney and I agree on something. Well, one thing that we do agree on is the need for reform of our apportionment process, which has uh, not produced good outcomes under Republicans or Democrats uh, over the last 50 years. 
the truth of the matter is, though, that the Senate put a bipartisan uh, reform package forth uh, in 2009 when my opponent was in the legislature and in the majority, they would not move that bill through the House because they made a cold calculation that they were likely to hold on to power and be able to draw the districts themselves in 2010, and they killed reform. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Bridges, you do have uh, uh, 90 seconds left on the clock. I would like to point out one more thing that we all have in common standing up here. Not one of us is an auditor. You heard by their opening statements that they're both attorneys. I am a small business owner. As a matter of fact, I'm a tow truck driver. I understand what it's like to live a blue collar lifestyle. I understand what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. I understand vitally how important it is for every tax dollar that is taken from a citizen of Ohio that is, it is spent appropriately and in the right place. Like I said, I'm not long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, now we will turn our attention to the moderated questions. Uh, in this and with questions we'll have later from the audience, questions to a specific candidate will be allowed a 90-second response, and the other candidates will have 30 seconds to respond. Uh, questions directed to all three candidates, uh, each man up here will have 90 seconds to respond. Um, I want to begin, and I want to give each of you the full 90 seconds to respond to this question. Uh, we will begin with um, Jobs Ohio. Uh, Auditor Yost, uh, you've performed an audit of uh, Jobs Ohio in a move that puts you at odds with many in your own party. Uh, the legislature has now voted to make sure this nonprofit agency is more shielded from future audits by the state audit. Um, however, uh, uh, there, are still, uh, there still may be a role that the auditor could play in this process. And I want to ask, where do we go from here? Um, are there questions that still need to be answered about Jobs Ohio, and how would you propose to answer them? Um, I, I want to start, uh, we'll start with Mr. Bridges, and we'll work our way down this way. We have 90 seconds. It's an interesting conundrum we have here in the state of Ohio. We have a private industry control, taking public dollars to benefit the state of Ohio. When you put in law, a blockage for the auditor to do his job, there's something wrong there. Every agency out of the 5,800 government entities in the state of Ohio needs to be looked at. If you're taking tax dollars from the state of Ohio, you can guarantee that I, as your auditor, am going to be looking into your books. Thank you very much. Mr. Carney. Thank you very much. Well, certainly from my personal experience, I realize how important having a job is to so many Ohioans. If it were, wasn't for those jobs I had growing up, I would not have been able to get the education I needed uh, at Ohio State to be successful. And Jobs Ohio, that's your money. Uh, it's supposed to be creating jobs here in Cleveland for you and the people who live in this community. Now, Mr. Yost has said that he was going to audit Jobs Ohio. First, he said, I'll keep the audit secret for five years. Then he said, well, we're not going to do that anymore, but I'm going to audit Jobs Ohio. I want all the financial records. He got the financial records and then publicly stated that the chairman of the Republican Party said, you've chosen poorly to audit Jobs Ohio. That's not a good idea. And Mr. Yost then backed down and did not do a financial audit of Jobs Ohio. He will tell you that he did an audit of Jobs Ohio. But in fact, the audit is a compliance audit of its conflicts policy, not a financial audit, despite the fact that he got the financial records to actually conduct a financial audit. Now, this is your money. Every time you purchase liquor in the state of Ohio, it goes and supports the ability of the state to create jobs. The auditor is created under the Constitution. It's the responsibility of the auditor as the chief inspector of Ohio to follow the money. And unfortunately, our experience with Mr. Yost is he backed down to political bosses instead of looking out for the taxpayers. I will stand up for the people of Ohio. That's who I work for, not for political bosses, not for the governor, not for anybody else. Mr. Carney, thank you very much. Mr. Yost. Well, it's not quite the way it went down. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we pushed, we did negotiate, we tried to find some common ground, which I think is what the people of Ohio expect of us, is not to go in with guns blazing, but to try to do our job. But you know what, when we couldn't reach an agreement, 
I resorted to the power of the office. I issued a subpoena for all of the records for Jobs Ohio. They fought me. They cut off communication. I had every indication that we were going to court. And at the last minute, the records were produced. We did conduct a uh, compliance audit because what was at issue still, there had already been a financial audit, you see, by an IPA, which, Mr. Carney, about 40% of the work done by the office, not only by under me, but historically going back into time under Republicans and Democrats has been done by independent auditors. The piece that hadn't been done, that wasn't duplicative, was to look at how the work was being done, whether they were complying with the statutes, whether, whether there were conflicts of interest. We did that, we published our report. Now with regards to the legislative action, uh, I made my point very clear publicly that I didn't think that it was a wise action. But we live in a government that has a balance of power, divided power, separation of powers, and they elected to go forward and, and change the law. I still think it was a bad idea. I haven't Joe, changed my opinion. Uh, we, we'll turn now um, to uh, another part of the auditor's job, and that is to look at uh, local government entities, including district and charter schools. And I want to begin by asking about charters. Uh, we'll begin with Mr. Carney, uh, followed by Mr. Yost and Mr. Bridges. In the early part of last decade, the auditor's office played a role in formulating the rules that currently govern our charter schools. Now, recently, a member of the National Association for Charter, schools, charter School Authorizers has referred to Ohio as the wild, wild west for charters. Are the rules that we currently have in place uh, still working and, uh, in, in terms of educating kids and making good use of public money? Or uh, do we need to revamp them? And if so, how? Mr. Carney. Clearly they're not working. And for me, education is a critical component of individuals' ability to live their own American dream. Uh, if it weren't for decent public schools in Bay Village, I would not be where I am in life. And for many of us, if it wasn't for a decent education, we would not be where we are. Unfortunately, what's happened here in the state is the worst schools are getting the most money out of the folks in office. Now, my opponent will tell you I found finding for $140 million in lost charter school revenue. We haven't been able to collect most of it, but he will make that point. Unfortunately, in this budget, you can see where White Hat Management, run by David Brennan, got $600 more per student. ECOP, run by Bill Logger, the online classroom of tomorrow, got $300 more per student, even though they're the two worst charter school operators in the state. Their graduation rates are horrible. Their outcomes are horrible. What happened to the best charter schools in the state? They took a cut. Not only have we been called the wild, wild west, we've been called the poster child of what not to do. Education is a right of our citizens. It is a right of you as parents to have the opportunity of your child to get an excellent education so they can pursue their dreams and find a great job. It's not about figuring out how to repay campaign contributors, but that's what it's become here in Ohio. There hasn't been proper oversight. Our experience with Mr. Yost is he has not been willing to stare down some of the same people who have made significant campaign contributions to him. It's time we have somebody who looks out for your best interests. That's what I will do. Mr. Carney, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Yost. Well, it sounds as though my distinguished opponent, who spent six years in the legislature, uh, misunderstands the office. You see, we don't have a vote on the law, and the money and the rules that he's complaining about are matters for the legislature, not, not for the auditor. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe that we do need some changes into the law, and I'm hopeful that my colleagues in the legislature, I see Mar Marlene Anielski's here today in the audience, I'm hoping that uh, we can have a dialogue about those changes that need to happen. But let me tell you what we have done. For example, right here in Cuyahoga County, we had a place called Lion of Judah, and they had four separate schools. Uh, they got state aid of $4.1 million over a four-year period. Uh, our findings for recovery just for that school were $1.8 million. It was run by crooks. They were self-dealing. There were ethics violations, and we found it. We reported it, not because anybody pushed us to do it, but because that's our job. I, too, uh, think that education is the first step of opportunity in our society which is why I haven't limited my work just to charter schools, 
but have looked out for kids in our public schools too, and I hope to have a moment to talk about that later. Mr. Yost, thank you very much. Mr. Bridges. Not only is the auditor's office looking out for the money, also performance audits. It is imperative that we look at the charter school systems and audit accordingly. Same with public schools. We owe our children the best opportunity of education that we can afford. And here in Ohio, I've watched it decline since I graduated in 88. It's gone downhill. Why? As a libertarian, I preach school choice. I preach the fact that everybody should have a right to an education and every child should be able to go to whatever school the parents seem fit. If you're a blacksmith, for example, and you want your son to go to college to be a lawyer, and he has that aptitude, he should be put on that path as such. We hear a lot of bickering about the money, and I commend Mr. Yost for the audits that he's done and the discrepancies that he's found in the charter school system. But we can do better here in Ohio. We can do a lot better. Thank you very much, Mr. Bridges. I want to stick with education for a moment, and we'll turn our attention now to district schools. We'll begin with, um, we'll begin with Mr. Yost, followed by Mr. Bridges and Mr. Carney. The auditor's office recently played a role in investigating the data rigging scandal in the Columbus schools. Over the next four years, how would you ensure that school officials are held accountable and that cheating does not happen? Mr. Yost? Well, the good news is that of the statewide 614 school districts, 605 of them didn't cheat. We did a statewide audit looking for problems. Uh, so most of your uh, folks working for you are actually following the law. But we are already in Columbus City Schools doing a follow-up audit to confirm that the reforms that have been in place there are actually being followed. We'll continue to do that. We will use new techniques like data mining. Uh, we pioneered some sampling techniques uh, and statistical techniques in partnership with Ohio State University uh, two years ago when we started the Columbus City Schools audit. At the end of the day, the results of that, we're looking out for those powerless people, the kids. What we found at the end of that audit was that there were 20 school buildings that should have been el eligible for education vouchers, excuse me, that had lower grade cards. There were four schools that were eligible for education scholarships, hundreds of kids that were denied an opportunity for a better education because the adults cheated. I'm really proud of that. When I talk about standing up for those who are powerless and holding the powerful accountable, that's one of the things that I mean. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bridges. I'm sorry, you have to read. Uh, the question is about the, the role that the auditor played in investigating the data rigging scandal in Columbus schools and how would you ensure that cheating does not happen uh, over the next four years as a state auditor? Simply, open books, open records. Right now, you know, we have a sunshine request in Ohio and anybody can request open records. And if you're so desired, you can do the request and it will be sent to you. So every record be made public and open. Everything, everything, attendance, money spent, money given, so everybody can see with their own eyes what's going on. Not, there shouldn't just be one auditor of state in Ohio. There should be 13 million auditors of state in Ohio. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Carney. Thank you very much. Well, excellent school should be a bipartisan drive. Uh, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. And the, the idea that we should be searching and supporting excellent schools is something that we should all be worried about. Certainly concerns with respect to Columbus schools and rigging attendance is problematic, and I give my opponent some credit on his efforts there. Unfortunately, similarly, 
We had a parent from the electronic classroom of tomorrow who came forward who said they went to Mr. Yost's office and told Mr. Yost, my child's been credited for being at school for 100% of the time. My child has not been at school 100% of the time. I have real concerns that they are falsifying attendance records. Yet, has there been a investigation? No, that's why this woman, this mother came to our office to say that we're not getting any follow through on similar attendance rigging problems at ECOT. Similarly, we had a teacher from Horizon Science Academy who approached Mr. Yost and said, we have found that the FBI is investigating Horizon Science Academy, telling us that in fact, sexual harassment is going on, that they're warehousing children, that they're showing them movies during the course of the school day. Here's the letter. And he took the letter saying that the FBI was investigating. Instead of opening an investigation and looking into Horizon Science Academy himself, he sent the letter to the FBI. Well, they were already aware, obviously, the investigation was going. We need an independent, strong auditor looking out for your best interests. That's what I will do. Mr. Kearney, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have time for one more question here from me uh, before we turn it over to this very nonpartisan audience to uh, provide the rest of our questions. <laughs> Um, and this question looks at the role the auditor plays in um, helping local governments get out of fiscal distress. The auditor plays a big role in this process. And there are communities across uh, the state that are in this situation. In Northeast Ohio, it's East Cleveland and Maple Heights, but it's also Massillon and the city of Galleon and many others. Um, these are cities that have seen declining tax revenues since the financial crisis, and they face very difficult uh, choices. What should the auditor's office be doing to assist cities like East Cleveland uh, after finding the problems and knowing the problems? How do you get to the solutions? We'll begin this um, with uh, Mr. Bridges, followed by Mr. Carney and Mr. Yost. We do best practices. We take a look around the state and see what's working in like-sized communities. Uh, pick one, Troy, for example, over on the west side of the state are, are same size communities. Then say Pick was in financial trouble and Troy is not. Why is Troy doing better? What's going on? We'll take a look. And then we'll go back to Pick with city leaders and show them this is what Troy's doing. This is what you're not doing. Why don't we get up to speed and save the people of Ohio some money? That's what I would do. Thank you very much, Mr. Carney. Thank you. Well, certainly the concerns with East Cleveland are very real. And whether or not the city decides to merge or declare bankruptcy is the sort of thing that the state auditor should be working with local elected officials in Cle East Cleveland, in Cleveland, because certainly if East Cleveland merges into the city of Cleveland, Cleveland is accepting those ongoing liabilities. And so an ongoing conversation with the actual leaders and people who live in that community about a strategy to move forward to get to solvency is key. Now, the auditor does have another role, which is to show the shell game that is happening with local funds. Whether it's local government funds or local education funds, many, many of those dollars have been traveling back to Columbus and not coming back to the communities where they've been generated in the first place. And the auditor of state should be pulling the curtains back in a bipartisan way to demonstrate, this is your money, you pay it locally, and it is coming to Columbus and is sitting in a rainy day fund or paying for Medicaid or paying for a host of other things besides city services that it was intended to be used for in the first place or for education services that it was intended to be used for in the first place. Certainly my libertarian and Republican opponents both tend to be concerned about money going to Washington DC and not returning from whence it's come. That is the sort of thing that the state auditor should be focusing his or her attention on to make sure that the public understands where their tax dollars are going and what they're getting for it, I will pull back the curtains and show you exactly where your money is being spent. Thank you very much, Mr. Carney. Mr. Yost. I have to go back to something my opponent raised very quickly, and that's attendance at charter schools. The fact of the matter is we have several ongoing projects that aren't in the newspaper, so he doesn't know about them, but they are ongoing. Something that is in the newspaper uh, was just last week, General Chappie James down in Montgomery County had we uncovered uh, horrible attendance problems there. We called it. Uh, we haven't published our report on it yet, but we did talk with ODE, and you know what? Those folks have closed. And I think importantly because of our work in that. With regards to fiscal distress for local governments, this is something that I've spent a lot of time on. I have had ongoing conversations, uh, Representative Carney, uh, with Frank Jackson and Gary Norton and many other community leaders here, both in public service 
uh, and in the private sector about the way forward for East Cleveland. The fact of the matter is there are places where the economy has changed uh, and the situation has become so difficult in East Cleveland, it's not clear that they have a way forward, but we're continuing to work with them. We have one other option uh, that I'd like to see the legislature uh, uh, enact for us. If a school is in fiscal distress, they get a free uh, performance audit paid for by the Ohio Department of Education under a line item appropriation. I think we ought to provide that same courtesy to our cities and towns and counties that find themselves in fiscal distress. Mr. Yost, thank you very much. Now we'll return to uh, Dan Moulthrop, who will explain the next portion of this debate. Actually, you're going to explain. Actually, Nick's going to explain that in a second. I'm just doing some <laughs> housekeeping. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a debate between State of Ohio Auditor candidates Bob Bridges of the Libertarian Party, John Patrick Carney of the Democratic Party, and David Yost of the Republican Party. This debate is moderated by Nick Castell of IdeaStream. We'll return to our speakers momentarily for our traditional City Club Q&A. We encourage you all to formulate your questions for our speakers now and ask that your questions be brief and to the point and be, in fact, questions. We welcome, that usually gets a laugh, but whatever. <laughs> we welcome all of you here and those joining us via our live webcast, which is sponsored by the University of Akron. Be sure to tune in to our Friday forums on 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ-PBS, 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream, which is our primary media partner, or one of the many radio stations and television stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Today's debate is sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Media Group, the City Club's sponsor of politics and policy programs. Thank you very much for your support. Today we also welcome guests at tables hosted by Bob Bridges, Libertarian for Auditor, Carney for Ohio, the Cuyahoga County GOP, friends of Michelle Stice, and friends of Dave Yost. We thank you all very much for your support and for being here today. Now, we return to all of you for our audience Q&A. All are welcome to ask questions, including guests. Holding microphones today, our Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky, and our Marketing and Outreach Specialist, Kirsten Pianca. Our first question. I direct this, candidate to, uh, this question to all three candidates. In this day and age of uh, growing political gridlock and extremist partisanship, would each of you give us, please, uh, examples of, 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 a comp of, of any, uh, your accomplishments in political bipartisanship that you have accomplished? Let's begin with uh, Mr. Carney, followed by Mr. Yost and Mr. Bridges. Thank you very much. Well, in my time in the legislature, over 92% of the bills I've sponsored and co-sponsored have had broad bipartisan support. And in fact, I believe in evidence-based ideas that the folks in elected office should actually be working together to bring the experts in and be informed by them. Uh, one of the first initiatives I worked on when I got elected was Healthy Choices for Healthy Children. The childhood obesity crisis in America has taken an incredible toll on our health care spending and something that certainly the physicians I work with understand well. And so we brought the folks from all the children's hospitals together in the state to form bipartisan legislation to move forward on changing meal plans and nutrition plans. Similarly, I've put together legislation on captive insurance policies in the state, worked with Republicans and Democrats and gotten that passed here in the state. I've worked together on a bipartisan plan to change the corporations law here in the state of Ohio, given my expertise as a health care corporate lawyer and things that we can do together to move the state forward. So in my half dozen years in office, consistently, as I say, over 92% of the bills I've worked on have had broad bipartisan support. I think it's about time that we actually draw legislative districts that encourage bipartisanship instead of partisanship. Washington, D.C. is the poster child of what happens when you have partisan districts and people being rewarded for partisanship. Nothing gets done. It's time that we start working together to accomplish the problems of the day instead of just pointing our fingers at each other and blaming each other for them. Mr. Carney, thank you very much. Mr. Yost. Well, my record, I think, speaks for itself. We, our Fiscal Integrity Act, for example, passed by an 81 to 7 uh, vote. You were one of the seven votes against it, even though I was a bipartisan good government bill, Representative Carney. Uh, and we have been right down the middle. Uh, we've managed to make management labor angry, Republicans and Democrats angry. I think if everybody's mad at you, you must be doing something right. I'd like to talk about, for just a second, my uh, 
opponent has talked three times now about 92%. He gets that number by co-sponsoring his bill, basically slapping his name on other people's work uh, of things that uh, are really important, like naming the last day in February as Rare Disease Month. If we actually look at the things that he has sponsored, his bills, not things that other people have done that he just put his name on, what we see is 12% of his bills were partisan, no co-sponsors from the other side in his first two-year session. But in his second two-year session, it went up to 44% were partisan. And this time, it's 71% in the current legislation. Every year he stays in office, he gets more partisan. If this trend continues and he becomes auditor, he'll be the most partisan auditor since Tom Ferguson. Mr. Yost, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bridges, this question about bipartisanship, I suppose we, we should be talking about tripartisanship it, correct. as a third-party candidate. Well, in, in the current state of affairs down in Columbus, as a libertarian, I'm bipartisan. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about me as a political activist. There was a towing bill that came up in, in uh, the legislature uh, down in Columbus that was sponsored and co-sponsored by a Republican and Democrat, respectively. I went down and gave expert testimony due to my profession and ended up having some very candid conversations with both Representative Duffy and Representative Bischoff on the towing bill. Collectively, the three of us have sat down and worked together to come up with a better piece of legislation for Ohio. The fact that I went down and lobbied so hard for this, they named an amendment after me. I, well, thank you. My resume does not compare to my opponents by no stretch of the imagination. However, that doesn't mean my passion isn't there. That does not mean the drive isn't there. And that does not mean I will not have your best interest in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question, please. Yes, um, I read in Policy Matters Ohio, uh, Plunderbun.com, and uh, Innovation Ohio that $30.5 million remains uncollected from charter schools that have closed. And uh, Representative Carney, you put forward uh, a bill uh, that dealt with auditing charter, charter schools. My question is, what were the details of that bill and where is it now? We'll, uh, we'll give uh, Mr. Carney, uh, since it was directed toward you, we'll give you the time to, uh, to answer it, and then our others will have uh, a chance to respond as well. I think the full time, 30 seconds. We'll do 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Well, fortunately, uh, you know, there is a lot of interest in holding charter schools accountable. Unfortunately, because of very partisan districts that were drawn by the folks on the apportionment board, there's not a lot of bipartisan interest right now in the legislature in helping to hold them accountable. And so the bill has not moved. Uh, what it would do is actually put in place real accountability measures for charter schools in the state. Uh, when I served on the budget, unfortunately, the Republicans in charge wrote the Charter School Operator Bill of Rights, which essentially takes all the ability to see what's happening in these charter schools away from you all. In fact, we've got a charter school operator here in the state that at the beginning of the year, he uses public money to buy public property for his schools. And at the end of the year, he believes that's private property. Can you imagine if a school teacher at the end of the year took all the books and the computers in the classroom and took them home? We'd be calling the local prosecutor saying they stole from us. Unfortunately, based upon the laws that have been passed here in Ohio, the Republicans in office believe that in fact, that's okay. With single party rule in Columbus, unfortunately, they have gone unchecked. Their biggest contributors seem to be stealing more and more to run really bad schools for you. And there isn't a willingness by those in office who are taking money from them to actually hold them accountable. As auditor, I wouldn't even need the legislation. I could just move forward on my own to, in fact, hold them accountable, an experience we have not gotten from Mr. Yost, but we would have with me in that office. Mr. Yost, you'll have uh, 30 seconds to respond. Well, every charter school gets an audit by my office. The uh, comments by my opponent, the legislature wrote based upon the laws. Uh, Representative Carney, uh, I appreciate your passion and your insight. And I'd like to invite you to run for the legislature again where you can actually do some good to change these laws. 
but the auditor doesn't get a vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Yost. Mr. Bridges, you also have 30 seconds. $50 million? Was that the, the number? 30.5. 30.5. 30 30.5 is the number she said. That is a lot of money missing, my friends. I don't know about you, but I've been on the other end of a collection debt where they call your phone relentlessly. They call your place of employment relentlessly. That's what I would have people in the office doing. Collections. Let's get the money back. Thank you very much, Mr. Bridges. Now to our, our next question. This question is to Mr. Yost. First, I want to thank you very much for continuing your acceptance to debate here at the City Club of Cleveland. I would like to know if you have any insight into why your fellow Republican state office holders, Treasurer of State, Secretary of State, Attorney General, withdrew from the debate process here? No. <laughs> but I would like to uh, clear up one thing about the, and I apologize for not responding to your question, ma'am. Uh, it was responding to some things that my colleagues had set up here. Uh, the collections under Ohio law as they are now, we make the finding the Attorney General's office is charged with uh, actually doing the collections. We've cooperated with them. There's been some changes that uh, Attorney General DeWine's made that have accelerated the process. Uh, it's still a difficult process, and there's some, uh, some old debt on the books. Um, but the auditor of state doesn't have the authority uh, under the law as it exists to uh, go after those collections. Although, uh, Representative Carney, you'll get it, even if you're successful here, you'll get a couple months in the lame duck session. Perhaps you can propose that the auditor of state uh, should go after the collections, uh, and I wouldn't be opposed to that. Uh, Mr. Bridges, you have uh, 30 seconds uh, if you'd like to respond to that question about uh, debates. It's interesting that the Republicans won't debate here. It's very interesting because the Republicans in Ohio have tried to do everything they can to eliminate my party from the ballot. What does the GOP have to hide? Are they afraid to exchange free ideas, talk about choice, talk about real things that matter in Ohio? It appears that way. No. Mr. Bridges, your, your time is up. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Mr. Carney, you also have 30 seconds. The people of the state of Ohio pay the salaries of everyone in elected office. It's their responsibility and obligation to appear before the public take questions, have a lively debate about what they've done and what they will do. Uh, I think it's shameful for anyone who's running for office to try to avoid appearing in front of those who employ us to actually hear from our employers and have a robust conversation about what we can do to improve the government that you're paying for. Mr. Carney, thank you very much. We've got another question right here. Uh, yes, uh, this is for Representative Carney. Uh, you've campaigned for more accountability with the state of Ohio, and my question is, why did you vote no for the Fiscal Integrity Act? Sure. So the Fiscal Integrity Act, which it's important for you to understand, is still in the legislature. It has not been passed out of the legislature. Uh, this is a, a part of political grandstanding that I'm not very fond of. Uh, the, the act actually creates more regulation and more bureaucracy, and that's why the Senate's passed a version and the House has passed a version, and neither have decided to actually move the other one along to the governor for signature. Uh, what was needed was due process rights for fiscal officers. We did not need to add additional bureaucracy and cost. And so, unfortunately, this is an attempt uh, for the auditor to say, I did something through the legislature, but my colleagues on both sides, Republicans and Democrats alike, have decided it's not worthy to pass through the two chambers and send to the governor. So it's actually still stuck in the legislature, Republicans being the ones who are holding it up. Mr. Carney, thank you very much. Mr. Yost, you have 30 seconds. The uh, bills in the Senate and the House are identical. They will pass. They uh, simply different vehicles. And the legislature ran out of time. But it does not create additional bureaucracy. It does things like allow people that aren't doing their job when they've got your checkbook to be removed from office for cause. It requires fiscal officers to actually have to take training 
so they know what they're doing with all those tax dollars that they're supposed to be handling. Mr. Yost, thank you very much. Mr. Bridges, you also have 30 seconds. First, thank you for not voting to increase government and more bureaucracy. As a libertarian, I want to see less government as possible. Government needs to be like a fire, as small and contained and manageable. What we have going on down in Columbus in the legislature on both sides, in the House and in the Senate, is out of control government. Of course, Mr. Bridges, thank you very much. Rebuttal, um, rebuttal. I'd like to know how education and removing incompetence is adding bureaucracy. Bob, can you help us understand that? Well, we've got to move now to another section here. And this, is, uh, this concludes our audience portion. And now we have a, a final question here for each of you to respond to. You each will have three minutes uh, to discuss this question. And uh, for this question, I'd like to ask you to uh, think big picture here about the job of auditor. Um, one of your major jobs is to look at the books of uh, local governments, including schools, including um, townships, villages, cities. And I want to ask you about, um, uh, you know, not every city and not every school district has the same uh, uh, tax base and has the same amount of money that they're able to provide uh, by taxing their citizens um, to fund their operations. And I want to ask you, looking big picture here, uh, do you believe that that is a, a, an acceptable setup to have? And how would you propose addressing these kinds of issues where some school districts and some local governments may have less money uh, to provide services to their citizens than others? And uh, we'll begin here with uh, Mr. Bridges. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, the, uh, the order uh, was already agreed upon, but that's correct. We'll begin with Mr. Bridges, followed by Mr. Carney and Mr. Yost. Other way around. Oh, you're right. Mr. Yost, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll begin with you, followed by Mr. Carney and Mr. Bridges. Well, I don't know that the, in fact, I do know that the auditor's state's job is not to appropriate money. It's not to allocate the resources of the state. That's the job of the legislature. And uh, the question that's raised is a very complicated one, and there's a lot that goes into it. I'm concerned uh, about the condition. Most, uh, the Cincinnati Inquirer showed that three to uh, three to five percent was the impact on most uh, local governments uh, of the recent cuts and private sector folks felt that and more. Um, but I'm concerned going to the next session that we uh, not take actions that are going to hurt our local governments. We've been collecting data and assembling a new system of analysis that uh, I hope will lead to a much more informed debate in the legislature in the next session. But let me close by telling you that this is the most important thing in my life. This job, politics, I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be a politician. And I don't eat and drink and sleep and breathe this stuff. Most important stuff to me is the life that happens outside these halls, outside City Hall, outside the State House. The families, the soccer games, the kids growing up, the good times that friends ha have, love and trust, a safe place called home. The reason that I'm in public service and will one day leave public service is because I want to help make that life for all of you, all of Ohioans, work. Government's there to provide that framework to allow you to live free and unafraid. It's not the be all, it's not the end all, it's not even the point of civil society, what the government does. It's what you do. It's how you choose to live your lives. I'm here to serve that and I, have been honored to serve you at a local level and at the state level for the last four years. I'm humbly asking you for the opportunity to continue to work for you so you don't have to worry about the government. Thank you. Mr. Yost, thank you very much. That was Mr. Carney. Mr. Carney. Thank you. Well, this has certainly been a, a long-standing problem here in the state when the income tax was originally passed. 
it was to address the issue you bring to mind, which is local governments having disparate abilities to raise revenue to support important local services. The Supreme Court of our state on multiple occasions has said the idea of raising property taxes to support schools is unconstitutional because of different property values in different communities. And yet, unfortunately, the legislature and those in office have gone in the opposite direction, in an unconstitutional direction. And the chief inspector of the state, a state auditor, should be showing you the shell game that's happening with your local money, where it heads back to Columbus and does not come back to support those services, whether it be schools or local governments and so on. We need someone in the auditor's office who's going to be strong and independent and work in a bipartisan way, who understands that when you say, I want state government to work, you don't draw legislative districts that incent partisanship, you draw districts that support bipartisanship, which is what I will do. We need a strong independent auditor who says, when we're gonna audit Jobs Ohio and we'll give you fiscal accountability, that we don't promise a five-year secrecy, we don't then not run a fiscal audit, we actually do what we tell the public we're going to do. We need a strong and independent auditor who says, when I'm holding charter schools accountable, I'm willing to go after those who've given me big campaign contributions because we're sending the most tax dollars to those very bad schools that aren't getting the job done for our children and for the parents in our state. That's what I will do. Unfortunately, our experience with the current auditor has demonstrated he's willing to say one thing and do something else. It's about time we have someone in elected office in the auditor's role who stands up for the people, who realize that their job ultimately is beholden to the public and not to political bosses, not to folks in elected office, and we cannot continue to have this unchecked one-party rule here in the state where partisanship reigns and the ability to stand up for those in local communities who deserve an opportunity for a decent education, who deserve an opportunity to have police and firefighters looking out for their community are robbed by the people in Columbus for partisan gains as opposed to good public policy. My record has demonstrated that over 92% of the bills that I have sponsored and co-sponsored while in office have had bipartisan support. I'm a healthcare lawyer that puts doctor's practices together all across the country. I've had great success putting those businesses together and making them work. Almost half your tax dollars here in the state are spent on health care budget items. You will be better served by having someone in an office who actually has real experience where the bulk of your money is being spent. It's time to put partisanship aside and stand up for government that works. That's what I've done my entire time in office. That's what I will continue to do. Mr. Carney, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bridges, you also have three minutes. <laughs> Folks, ask yourself this question today. Which of the three of us is in the better position to have nonpartisanship in the auditor's office? A Republican with a proven track record? Democrat with a proven track record? Libertarian? Yet to be seen. There are a lot of reasons why I ran for, for auditor, but the main one is to be the watchdog of the people's money, your money and my money. And I ask this, folks, just give me 1% of your trust and I'll earn the other 99%. You can guarantee that. Thank you. Mr. Bridges, thank you very much. We'll turn this back over to Dan Wolfram. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause, please, for our candidates? And as well, one for our esteemed moderator, Nick Castell. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been enjoying a debate between State of Ohio Auditor candidates Bob Bridges, John Patrick Carney, and David Yost, moderated by Nick Castell, as I said. Thank you very much. Mr. Bridges, Mr. Carney, and Mr. Yost. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Nick. Ladies and gentlemen, our forum is now adjourned.